This is Criminal Behaviorology, a combination of criminology and behavior analysis to assist the criminal and civil justice systems to improve our society in general. A podcast like no other. Here is your host, Timothy Joseph. September 19th is apparently International Talk Like a Pirate Day, not an official holiday. Actually, I think it was started by two comedians, but that has been recognized. So we're all supposed to talk like pirates. I'm going to, it'll just be me today going over some information about pirates. I've got a couple of books I picked up uh, about Great Lakes piracy. And then we're going to finish it off by by discussing some uh, information related to behavior analysis and piracy in uh, in the coastal waters of Somalia. Before we get started, I'll I'll say a great thank you to all our listeners out there. We've really had a lot of success with the last couple of podcasts over uh, the uh, right off the bat about. Uh, behavior analysis, operant conditioning, and domestic violence, and also Kent Corso's uh, interview on preventing suicides in the military and among veterans. A lot of great responses, and we really appreciate it. Now, I was there in Mackinac Island, uh, there in Mackinac, Michigan, and I picked up a couple of, of books. The first one has the great title, Pirates, Crooks, and Killers, The Dark Side of the Great Lakes. Ooh. And on the back of the book, it says, While the Great Lakes never had swashbuckling pirates like those that swept the Caribbean seas, there were low lives willing to rob and pillage when the opportunity presented itself. Others were not above moon cussing or showing false lights to lure ships to wreck on onshore reefs where they pillaged the cargoes and murdered the crews. When the economy went south, some ship owners were not above purposely wrecking or sinking their own ships to collect the insurance money. That's not a bad idea. Whether the crew survived was not a critical consideration, even while ashore sailors were not safe from the clutches of evildoers. Unknown crewmen were slipped a mickey in a waterfront bar and once out cold robbed, then dropped through a trap door in the floor into the river or harbor. Local papers usually didn't even mention it when their bodies were eventually found. This is Pirate Crooks and Killers, The Dark Side of the Great Lakes by Frederick Stonehouse. And he opens up the book with someone that we've already covered here on the podcast about James Strang, uh, the known sometimes as the King of Beaver Island. We covered him on a podcast uh, earlier in the year with Tobin Book on his uh, book about uh, crime in Michigan, Michigan's true crime. So it starts out, Arg, pirate's of the sweet water seas strang's mormon buccaneers and just a briefing on james strang he was an offshoot of of the mormon religion and decided to set up his own kind of colony on beaver island with his followers and they became uh, a great influence on the island and uh, it led to some some conflict. So it starts out whether uh, whether or not the tales of of James Strang are accurate. The heyday of Mormon occupation of Beaver Island, which is in Lake Michigan, uh, Strang and his Mormons were accused of doing just the kind of pirate-like acts, and of course. We know dead men tell no tale, tell no tales. Jesse James Strang was a character of the first rank. 
Born in New York, he tried his hand at various professions, including teaching, being a lawyer, temperance lecturer, newspaper editor, and postmaster before finding his true talent, profit, and it's spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Being a prophet is a tough job. Not many schools teach you how to do it, nor, at least in this writing, is there a profiting for dummies book in print. During this early period of Great Lakes history, the area was still wild and woolly. Men to enforce the law were few and far between, whether state, local, territorial, or federal. The only way to implement federal law was via the guns of the U.S. Navy gunboat Michigan, certainly a big hammer for often small nails. Massive deposits of iron and copper in Michigan's upper peninsula had triggered a mineral rush unlike anything before in the country. The vast white pine was just beginning the great cutting with, quote, timber pirates, unquote, stealing huge amounts from federal land. A lack of federal agents made timber thieving a crime rarely prosecuted. The great stocks of lake trout and whitefish were also free for the taking. White traders regularly bartered cheap whiskey with the local Indians for fur, cheating the Indians at every possible opportunity. It was in this tumultuous environment Strang and his small flock of 25 souls arrived at Beaver Island. It was not a good scene. The residents were quite happy in their lives and suddenly having Strang and his band of merry Mormons turn up was not good. Remember, Strang and his crew thought of themselves as God's chosen people, which means the non-Mormons on the island were not. It was definitely a downer for the islanders. Adding insult to injury, Strang also called his followers saints and the other folk Gentiles. Soon Strang had a divine revelation. It was part of the requirement to be a prophet. He had himself crowned as king of Beaver Island. A bit of a megalomaniac, he also renamed the town St. James and the bay fronting the settlement St. James Harbor. After another revelation, he instituted polygamy. Eventually, he had five wives, including a set of sisters. Once the island was purely King Strang's Mormon Empire, his piratical activities escalated, or so claimed newspaper reports. The Green Bay Spectator wrote that his men were plundering local fishermen of their catch and fishing gear. This wasn't the minor crime we might view it as today. Commercial fishing was a major activity in the waters around the island, and losing catch and equipment ruined not only fishermen, but also de decreased an important local food supply. When fish weren't caught and processed, families starved during the long winters. A buffalo paper claimed the Mormons had driven off all the fishermen, stolen most of their property, and made a business of appropriating whatever they can lay their hands on belonging to boats which, which make their call there. This is called piracy. Later in the book, Strang's reign as a pirate king was short. His high-handed tactics angered many of his followers as well as the occasional Gentile he came in contact with. Taxes were increased, public whippings for backsliders, stiff fines, and even rumors that problem, in quotes, men mysteriously disappeared. The last act started when one of his followers, Thomas Bedford, was caught We'll say he's caught with a, uh, another man's wife. That's called adultery and an absolute forbidden practice by Strang's law. The stated penalty was 79 lashes, though only for the man. The woman was apparently not considered to be at blame. Regardless, Bedford was duly hauled out of the public whipping post and lashes were administered. The outcome of the flogging was Bedford became a relentless, relentless enemy of King Strang. He began to plot against the king and drew others into his web. Some sources suggest as many as 40 men, still a small number considered, considering the large colony on the island. 
The plot against Strang draws tighter on June 6, 1854, when two of Bedford's plotters meet with the new captain of the USS Michigan in Chicago and tell him of the terrible state of affairs on the island, particularly about the horrible things the king is saying about the federal government. The captain, like his predecessor, decides to visit the island, but delays long enough to allow the two plotters to reach Beaver before he does. Doubtless, the two confer with Bedford about the results of their meeting. On the morning of June 16th, the USS Michigan arrives at Paradise Bay and moors at the largest dock. The captain sends a message to ask Strang to come to the boat. As Strang is walking past a lumber stack heading for the Michigan, Bedford and a companion step out from behind and empty their pistols at the fearless leader. Strang was mortally wounded, shot in the face, back, and head, succumbing to the attack on July 8th. It was six years to the day he was crowned king of Beaver Island. When the Gentiles Strang had forced off the island heard the good news of his impending demise, they quickly organized arriving at the island on July 5th through the 6th. The heavily armed group of 50 to 60 men were there for just one reason, vengeance, to take back what Strang had stolen from them. Within days, the Strangites were driven off the island and onto steamboats for Chicago, Detroit, or anywhere the boats would take them. Everything but what they could carry was left on the island. Searching several of the storehouses, the Gentiles found evidence of looting of ships long complained of. Boxes of china, shoes, and furniture. All manner of freight filled the buildings. The men clearly saw it as evidence of the Mormon pirates at work. What pirate story would be complete without a whiff of buried treasure? According to rumor, King Strang's gold is buried in Fox Lake in a large chest. Supposedly, folks have looked for it without success. But they, then again, if it was found, why tell anyone? Well, exactly, why not? So that's a different, that's a variation of piracy, but it is a kind of maritime crime. The next section of the book covers uh, a rather enigmatic fellow known as Dangerous Dan Seavey, S-E-A-V-E-Y. Captain Dan Seavey is one of those larger-than-life characters it is near impossible to get your arms around. Was he a pirate, honest sailor, independent entrepreneur of varying interests? The jury is out and will likely never come in with a verdict. What is certain is he was a powerful figure who added much to the lore and legend of the Great Lakes. Because his exploits were so well known, real or imagined, he was a great subject for Sunday newspaper feature writers who sometimes called him Roaring Dan Seavey, attributing all manner of feats to him. One called him the Lone Pirate of Michigan. And Dan Seavey has uh, his own chapter in another book, Michigan Rogues, Desperados, and Cutthroats. And the author is Tom Powers uh, from 2005 was when that pu book was published. It says, Captain Dan Seavey never made anyone walk the plank, never hoisted the skull and crossbones, and never had a peg leg or a parrot. But there was enough swash and buckle in this waterborne outlaw's life to rank with the best and more famous Caribbean predecessors. Seavey's skullduggery variously included smuggling liquor, turning his boat into a whorehouse and a gambling casino, boat theft, common thievery, poaching, and murder. As with most pirate stories, it's sometimes difficult to separate fact from the fanciful, and there seems to be at least two versions of nearly every major event in Seavey's life. But one thing's certain, unlike the majority of pirates who sailed the Caribbean during the Great Age of Piracy in the 17th and 18th century, Dan Seavey did not end up with a noose around his neck. 
So apparently, uh, reportedly born March 23rd, 1865 in Portland, Maine. Even as a boy, sailing came second nature to C.V., who ran away from home at 13 and went to sea on a tramp steamers. While still in his teens, he also signed up for a stint in the Navy. After serving out his enlistment, Dan headed west and worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Wisconsin and Minnesota before returning to the water as a commercial fisherman and fish market owner in Milwaukee. He gave up the sea when he married and had a daughter. Some claim C.V. also owned at least two bars and a farm. That is, until gold fever infected him and he cast aside everything, including his family, to join the Alaska Gold Rush. Okay? When his fever broke, gold fevers, so uh, so C.V. was also broke. Pocket, pockets empty, he returned from Alaska in the 1800s and drifted to Escanaba. There, legitimately or otherwise, Dan acquired, Dan acquired a trim little two-mastered schooner, the Wanderer, and announced that he was starting a small freight boat service that would take anything to any port on Lake Michigan. In reality, the business served as a cover for piracy. C.V. and a small crew would silently slip the Wanderer with no running lights into ports in the dead of night and make off with anything on wharves and unlocked warehouses or on nearby streets that was of value and could be carried on the schooner. On one occasion, they crept into a port, loaded the Wanderer with lumber that had been awaiting the arrival of another schooner, and after transferring the wood, Dan, Dan noticed two oxen staked out on the wharf. He and the crew would drive the animal. He had the crew drive the animals on board, figuring the oxen could be helpful in unloading the lumber. If not, they could be eaten. Another one of C.V.'s favorite enterprises was to pluck cargo from boats that had been driven ashore by storms, poor seamanship, or other fates of the sea. As the ships foundered on rocks and sandbars, they were often abandoned by their crews, and under maritime law, their cargo became free pickings for salvagers like C.V. C.V. also added another unique line item to his resume, poaching. Now, poaching and piracy are seldom spoken of in the same breath. Blackbeard didn't earn his fearful reputation by hunting out of season, and Long John Silver didn't teach out Treasure Island, didn't search out Treasure Island because of its valuable deer herd. Okay, Pirate Dan Seavey, however, poached deer and did so very profitably. In fact, shortly after the turn of the 20th century, Seavey monopolized the Chicago venison market. Venison was in especially great demand during the fall months, and Dan met all orders by harvesting deer from the large herd on Summer Island just off the Garden Peninsula. Seavey packed the wanderer with iced venison and delivered the meat to wholesale to a wholesale company controlled by Chicago's criminal element. Here it gets a little more interesting. At least once, more likely regularly, C.V. turned the Wanderer, his boat, into a floating whorehouse. One Charlevoix man during his later years recalled that he had watched the Wanderer probably headed for the sexually undernourished lumberjacks of East Jordan and Boyne City sail up the Pine River and pass under the bridge into Round Lake with a boatload of tarts lining the gunwales and showing off their wares. C.V., however, never tried, never tied up a dock when the wanderer lifted her skirts and entertained men, but instead cautiously anchored offshore and brought customers aboard by dory. But above all, Captain Dan C.V. loved to fight. He was a terrific brawler who paid no attention to any damn fool rules. C.V., like most other northern Michigan fighters, subscribed to simpler structures. No knifing, no gunplay. As long as you used only your bare hands and teeth, you could tear your opponent limb from limb or proceed vigorously toward the, that goal until he cried uncle. 
So at some point, Mr. Seavey was appointed as a U.S. Marshal, a deputy as a U.S. Marshal. And the book goes on to say that even that did not end his fighting days. And on occasion, his arrest of a lawbreaker turned into as great an exploit as his old piracy escapades. The most celebrated story chronicles the time when not long after his appointment as a lawman, C.V. superiors aimed him at a trader known for smuggling whiskey to Indians in the U.P., which is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The newly minted lawman caught up with his man in a bar. When C.V. informed the smuggler that he was under arrest, the man replied, If you can drag me outside, I'll board your schooner for Chicago. C.V. must have delighted to find that law enforcement could be so damn much fun. The marshal readily agreed to the challenge and had a couple of celebratory drinks with his adversary before they went at it. Those present remember the brawl as going on for what seemed like forever, with the combatants occasionally calling a truce and downing a glass of whiskey before pitching into each other again. Dan finally floored his man, but he felt he needed another injection of whiskey in order to get the smuggler out the door. Not wanting to give the man the advantage of a drink or allowing him back on his feet, Dan pinned him to the floor by propping a piano on his neck. Then, when refreshed, Dan lifted the piano off the smuggler and, on second thought, offered him a last drink before dragging him from the saloon. The smuggler, however, didn't respond, didn't get up, and never got up. He died the next day. C.V. filed a report, but was never questioned about the incident. It is not known how long Dan served as a deputy marshal, but he reputedly was still picking fights and bars at the age of 60. C.V.'s life as a pirate was long and profitable, and some have speculated that he earned an unbelievable unconfirmed and frankly unsupported million dollars as an outlaw. Whatever the amount, no one's sure what happened to it. Some have bestowed a Robin Hood reputation on C.V., saying that he gave most of his money to unspecified poor and children. No one has reported legends or rumors of buried treasure. One thing is certain. He did not take it with him to the grave. Captain Dan Seavey, the last of his kind, died in a died a pauper in a convalescent home in Wisconsin on February 14th, 1949. Well, as you can see, some people lead interesting lives. I have an interest in piracy in particular as a crime because it was once something that was so prevalent and it's been it had varying degrees of of prevalence throughout history the united states went to war with the barbary pirates which were in the area of morocco and uh, tripoli and algiers uh, in around 1801 to 1815 that was the first barbary wars uh, that it helped form the u.s navy and, of course, we know about the Pirates of the Caribbean and much of that kind of history. It, it was very commonplace. It does still exist today, although it, it's, in, it's in key areas. And I'll, I'm going to go over a, a paper on that particular subject about uh, piracy that is in the coastal waters of Somalia. In Behavior and Social Issues... 2009, pages uh, 136 to 154, uh, Todd A. Ward, he's actually, he's uh, on this paper, he's listed as being at the University of Nevada. He's a, a well-known speaker and lecturer on behavior analysis. and So he wrote, Piracy in Somalia, Interbehavioral Assessment and Intervention. Maritime piracy off the coast of Somalia has been thrust into the international spotlight due to its effects on the international financial markets and hence the livelihood of many individuals around the world. 
Furthermore, the history of Somalia itself is one of continuous failed attempts at establishing stability in the country. While recent piracy literature offers suggestions for intervention, they are in need of further elaboration and specification. Given these factors, the author provides an analysis of this pressing issue from a behavior analytic perspective. The issue of how and why a science of individual behavior is relevant to cultural issues will be addressed utilizing Cantor's interbehavioral system of cultural psychology, which precisely delineates the subject matters of psychology from other sciences. As such, two specific interdisciplinary assessment and intervention plans are outlined that are fully integrated with recent behavior analytic research. One plan involves consultation with maritime academies, while the other requires behavior analysts to immerse themselves in Somali culture. An explicitly scientific approach may be what is needed to combat maritime piracy in Somalia. So how did piracy go from just a worldwide problem, something that they had to go to wars on, that was in the Great Lakes, that was in the Caribbean, that helped uh, influence so much of history? Why is it not more relevant? But in certain parts of the world, it is quite relevant. What are the contingencies in the environment that have had such a dramatic influence on crime? I think that's a that's a fascinating question. So we'll turn now to that section he, that Todd A. Ward has in his paper about behavior analysis and piracy. Current solutions and obstacles. Because piracy is a truly international problem, not restricting to the targeting of ships from one country in particular, a sizable response from the world navies has followed. In fall of 2008, the United Nations Security Council passed a series of resolutions authorizing navies to enter Somali waters to attack and pursue pirates inland if necessary. Immediately following the UNSC resolutions, the United States created the multinational group Combined Task Force 151 in January of 2009, known as the CTF-151. The CTF-151 was designed specifically for counter-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean, and the Red Sea. In addition, the European Union created a similar force consisting of five navies, which at least nine other countries from around the globe have sent or are sending naval forces to the area to combat piracy in the Horn of Africa. Private security firms such as Blackwater, I don't think it's named that anymore, are engaging in counter-piracy activities in the area as well. In April of 2009, two days after U.S. Navy SEALs rescued Captain Richard Phillips of the American ship Maersk, Alabama, CNN reported Pentagon plans to intensify anti-piracy operations on the ground in Somalia. One factor contributing to the move inland is the large span of ocean area involved, mentioned previously, which severely limits the response times of naval forces in the area. The size of the ocean involved in the Horn of Africa is approximately 1.3 million square miles, severely limiting the response times of naval forces. Later in the article, the overwhelming consensus in the recent literature is that long-term solutions to piracy in Somalia involve stabilizing governmental and economic conditions within the country. Later on, the article says, the problem is that no one has proposed specific solutions for piracy other than the following general suggestions. A, that governmental agencies should work to combat piracy directly or to reestablish a functioning government, and B, that shipping companies should train and equip their crews to effectively respond to hostile pirate groups. Even if military intervention would successfully suppress piracy, the Somalis themselves would be forced to engage in other criminal activities to provide for themselves in their failed state, unless appropriate interventions are designed with this in mind. So the next section of the article is Behavior Analytic Solutions. 
The general strategies discussed previously are a good start toward the amelioration of piracy. However, greater specificity is needed regarding intervention plans and the steady string of failed attempts to establish to reestablish order in the country should should prompt the scientific community to offer refined solutions. The pressing question then concerns the practical role of behavior analysts with respect to maritime piracy. The first step is to define key problematic psychological and sociological events involved in the complex phenomena of piracy. Such, Such events then become the primary targets of intervention. Two assessment and intervention strategies which integrate Cantor's analysis with the current behavior analytic literature are proposed in order to guide specific types of applied work in this area. And Todd Ward is referring to J.R. Cantor. He wrote Interbehavioral Psychology in 19. 19- 58, which I've never read that, but I, I have I've heard that is a very influential book the, of interbehaviorism. And most of the time you hear about but about B.F. Skinner, but some of Cantor's ideas um, are also still very relevant. So it goes on in the article, one intervention strategy deals with short-term goals and emphasizes ship crews, while the second strategy will require significantly more time and resources, but deals with long-term goals and emphasizes conditions within Somalia itself. With respect to short-term goals, a prime target for intervention concerns those events that constitute hostile interactions of pirates with ship crews. These interactions are at the core of the piracy problem and are the primary means by which pirates and their organizations acquire monetary resources to fund their operations. The problem here concerns an interaction between two groups, in other words, a pirate crew and a ship crew, which is by definition a sociological problem. However, the behavior analyst intervening on this aspect of piracy would undoubtedly interact with particular ship crews to improve interpersonal interactions among crew members in the event of a hostile encounter with a pirate group. Thus, a sociological problem, in other words, interactions between ship crews and pirate crews, would be dealt with by altering the psychological characteristics of crew members, in other words, a psychological influence on sociological events. The simple reality is this. Ship crews will have to confront pirate groups for the foreseeable future. As such, The extent to which crews will be able to prevent pirates from seizing their ship will depend on the degree to which individual crew members can identify threats at sea early on and effectively coordinate their verbal problem-solving responses to prevent an attack. Recent behavior analytic work regarding communication networks, organizational rules, and decision-making during sudden life-threatening crises could have relevance to the current intervention plan. Behavior analysts regard organizational behavior, such as that found in work teams and ship crews, as largely verbal in nature. He cites some literature in regard to that. Part of this literature has focused specifically on the effects of explicit, implicit, Im- explicit, implicit, and heuristic rules on problem-solving behavior. As explicit rule states all three, an explicit rule states all three elements in a contingency, including the behavior, the reinforcing or punishing consequences it produces, and the antecedent stimuli or setting which occasions the behavior. An example, if you go to the store today, I will cook you dinner. An implicit rule, by contrast, states only part of a contingency. The command, don't do that, implies a receipt of punishing consequences for for a specific behavior in a given setting. Lastly, a heuristic rule serves as a broad guide to the discovery of a solution, an example of which will be given below. Under certain situations, certain types of rules, 
in other words, given by leaders, can be more effective at achieving organizational goals than others. In situations characterized by routine behavior patterns such as customer service procedures or routine crew tasks on a ship at sea, explicit rules given by a trustworthy source tend to minimize behavioral variability and maintain productivity. On the other hand, incomplete rules in the same situation can generate a degree of environmental ambiguity and a degradation of performance, including the emergence of unproductive attempts at verbal solving, at verbal problem solving among group members, which further degrades performance. By contrast, given situations in which highly creative performance is desired, such as at an advertising firm, implicit rules or heuristic rules, such as the metaphor, customers are like big fish, if you try to reel them in too fast, the line might break. May, prove, may improve performance while explicit rules may overly restrict behavior, leading to a decrease in productivity. Such rules can evoke variability in responding, particularly in experienced employees, which can create creative business solutions. When such behavior is considered within the context of communication networks, an organizational structure emerges. Uh, Humanfar, Rodriguez, and Smith, 2009, define a communication network as, quote, a description of the verbal interactions that mediate influences in between components and organized groups and among individual members in a given organization, unquote. The same authors nicely illustrate the general ways in which communication networks can affect crisis management with a behavioral analysis of the 9-11 Commission report. A major finding was that the networks of information between various government agencies were designed primarily for Cold War threats from major world powers. These networks, the same networks, were insufficiently integrated for terrorist threats and have, that have come to fi define world politics in the 21st century. Unlike a superpower, terrorist activities are of a more covert and decentralized nature. During the events leading up to the 9-11 attacks, information sharing between various governmental agencies was insufficient such that gaps of knowledge were created among agencies. Had these networks been better coordinated, the agencies could have better taken advantage of intelligence leading up to the 9-11 attacks, as well as the coordination of information between agencies as the attack unfolded. In essence, what should have been a fluid information sharing system between different agencies acted instead as stovepipes that restricted information and led to information gaps in which Al-Qaeda took advantage. When a ship crew finds itself in an inevitable confrontation with a hostile pirate group. It is a situation in which environmental ambiguity is relatively high and the cognitive, in other words, verbal capacities of crew members may be inhibited in such an emotionally arousing situation. Such situations may call for a simple heuristic, for a few simple heuristic rules to guide the behavior of crew members who have to work and communicate creatively and quickly over a massive ship in response to the sudden changes in organizational goals from those related to the timely delivery of cargo to those pertaining to the survival of the crew. The latter may require a more fluid and integrated method of information sharing among crew members than may be necessary during normal operating conditions. The rules by which this behavior is evoked should be simple yet sufficiently general to allow creative solutions to emerge. Two organizations, the Massachusetts and Maine Maritime, Ac Maritime Academies, have recently incorporated anti-piracy training into their own standard curriculum. The before-mentioned behavioral literature re relevant to this area of intervention could nicely supplement existing training curriculums in these and other training centers. In order to do this, however, behavior analysts need to counteract these organizations and open up discussions related to the specifics of piracy encounters. From this, a baseline of sorts could be constructed regarding ship types, geographic locations, crew composition, and specific pirate characteristics. 
This information could direct effective intervention plans towards specific priority areas related to piracy encounters. Lastly, these interventions would be integrated with recent and relevant behavior analytic research. The second general area of intervention pertains to long-term solutions to piracy. Though this area would likely require much more time and resources than the former approach, this approach is likely inevitable as behavior analysts venture into complex social issues. More specifically, this approach entails recruiting behavior analysts to spend time on the ground in Somalia. Methodologically speaking, this entails the use of ethnographic observations in which the researcher immerses himself, herself, in the culture under investigation. There is, of course, a catch. 32 United Nations aid workers and staff have been killed on the streets of Somalia in 2008 alone. Even the few thousand African troops mentioned in Mogadishu rarely venture outside their base. Author Gettleman, 2009, notes that upon landing at Mogadishu's airport, passengers are asked to report their names, contact and information, and caliber of weapon. Before he ventured out into the country, Gettleman took a friend's advice and hired ten gunmen to serve as his escort. While such facts are discouraging, they do not render the possibility of this intervention strategy out of the question. Members of the media, like Gettleman, regularly visit Somalia as well as many other war-torn regions around the world. From a broader perspective, as previously mentioned, the history of Somalia can attest to repeated failures to establish any lasting stability in the country. Perhaps what is needed is a scientifically sound assessment and intervention on the problem like those that behavior analysts could provide. Such ethnographic studies could provide a detailed assessment of the pertinent psychological events involved in the daily lives of Somalis living in the various parts of the country and how they influence and are influenced by sociological events. As behavior analysts, we would aim our investigations toward the similarities and differences in personal histories and current living conditions of pirates and non-pirates across different geographic regions. Anu and Moki, 2009, provide a starting point by suggesting that the most Somali pirates originate from the northeast Somali region of Puntland, that's P-U-N-T-L-A-N, which happens to be the poorest region in the entire country. Thus, important questions here concern the methods of employment or modes of resource production available to Somalis, including the factors influencing their availability and their utilization. Like the previously mentioned intervention plan, for an in-country intervention of this type to have any real effect, the accurate and relatively precise assessment of the problem is needed. Thus, behavior analysts need to talk to people who have spent time in the region, as in United Nations officials, and get on the ground in Somalia themselves. The data on Puntland is particularly re revealing as it is its suggestion that piracy is not widespread throughout the country, but may be localized to specific regions. While Puntland may be the poorest region in the country, actual interventions of this type will require a community-by-community -community assessment of the specific factors contributing to low income and the factors promoting acts of piracy rather than other income-generating methods. We need data on the actual individuals who engage in piracy, their specific living conditions, and how these differ in terms of the incidence, in other words, the frequency within a population, and prevalence, as in the percentage of a population, of piracy acts relative to different regions. In addition, examining the verbal communities, which is suggested by Skinner in 1957, correlated with piracy acts could be beneficial. For instance, Spectre in 2009 suggests that many pirates regard themselves as protectors of their coastlines who view their ransoms as compensation for the supposedly 
deleterious effects of commercial fishing, something behavior analysts have recently termed a negative externality or a negative byproduct of organizational practices. If this is merely a false belief on the part of pirates themselves, Biglin's recent call to incorporate the Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act literature into the alleviation of cultural problems could be relevant. As Biglin in 2009 describes, an important notion in ACT is psychological flexibility. Psychological flexibility involves a recognition of thoughts as just that and nothing more. When an individual recognizes this, they can diffuse from those thoughts or come to recognize that the thought is false. Regarding piracy, then, if behavior analysts were to promote psychological flexibility in those individuals who verbally justify their actions as compensation for deleterious fishing practices, these individuals may come to see their thoughts as false, diffuse them diffuse from these thoughts and engage in alternative means of income generation. If, on the other hand, fishing companies have indeed produced deleterious effects on the natural resources of the region, then Biglin's 2009 analysis of externalities itself may be of value and the rest of the recent special issues in the Journal of Organizational Behavioral Management that is referred to devoted to behavioral systems. Analysis. One could view externalities in relation to their organizational originators as sociological phenomena that play a role in promoting piracy as a cultural practice. Unlike the previously mentioned short-term solutions, long-term community-wide interventions would primarily be sociological, not psychological in nature, in that they would target whole populations of a community with the implementation of new organizations and associated community programs that provide greater opportunities for the inhabitants of the community in question. The assessment leading up to the intervention, however, would provide psychological data in conjunction with sociological data that would allow a fine-tuned assessment of the appropriate community intervention. Lastly, such ethnographic interventions would likely involve behavior analysts working in conjunction with the United Nations in order to stabilize the region sufficiently for a lasting government to take root. As the history of Somalia suggests, interventions such as these may be necessary before stability will return to the country. In the conclusion, the current paper served to provide a behavior analytic account of piracy in Somalia. In doing so, an important issue regarding the role of science of individual behavior in relation to cultural phenomena was addressed. Cantor's 1982 Interbehavioral System of Cultural Psychology is designed around this very issue. In detailing the specific subject matter of psychology, he simultaneously details the interrelations of psychology with the subject matters of other sciences, which is invaluable given the interdisciplinary nature of social issues. Cantor's systemic approach to science is particularly suited to address two primary issues with respect to piracy in Somalia. First, when one applies Cantor's detailed account to piracy in conjunction with recent developments in behavior analysis, the existing piracy literature benefits from the further elaboration of relatively specific intervention areas in this complex social issue. Second, as previously stated, Cantor's approach is regarded by many as the most naturalistic and thoroughly systematized psychology since Aristotle. The repeated failures to stabilize Somalia in the last two decades may call for a more scientific basis for interventions than have been present before. The present analysis unquestionably stems from such a basis. In closing, the amelioration of social problems has been at the philosophical core of behavior analysis since its inception. The investigative operations characteristic of radical behaviorism have led to an effective technology of behavior change for a wide variety of psychological problems. 
However, Cantor's thoroughly systematized and naturalistic philosophical perspective can supplement such operations, as Skinner's original dream of cultural change, by recognizing the interrelations of psychological events with those of other sciences, which Ward himself wrote about in 2008. In this interdisciplinary fashion, we can contribute to real change on the world stage and to the development of a naturalistic, marketable, and sophisticated approach to the analysis and amelioration of social issues. Gettleman, 2009, notes, quote, I felt the incandescent fury of the Iraqi insurgency raging in Fallujah. I've spent freezing cold, eerily quiet nights in an Afghan cave. But nowhere was I more afraid than in today's Somalia, unquote. Somalia is the ultimate challenge. If behavior analysts can produce change here, they can do anything. Facebook page and other social media sites.